uh, I live and uh, work in the UK. Um, and here in uh, the UK, we have um, a tradition that we're kind of rooting for the underdog. And I've always done that, uh, whether it's been Taiwan or Lithuania. Uh, so you know where my sympathies lie. Um, I think um, this is actually a, um, a sentiment that is um, shared more, more broadly. Uh, when I speak with uh, just common common folks here here in the UK or in mainland Europe, um, I, I sense a lot of sympathy uh, for underdogs. Um, but uh, this kind of sympathy is not always shared on the elite level. Uh, so let's take uh, Germany as an example. Um, so if you think of like leading uh, politicians or uh, CEOs of big German conglomerates, um, or, or even um, individuals who, who work in, uh, um, let's say, in the publishing industry or in academia. Um, um, surprisingly, you, you'll find that um, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, people who um, uh, have no qualms in uh, uh, arguing uh, Beijing's case. And um, I always found it counterintuitive um, uh, for the reasons mentioned uh, before. Uh, but we should not overlook that, uh, of course, uh, China has a lot of um, uh, influence in, in Europe and in Germany on the elite level. Uh, the elite channels are the primary channel for the Chinese Communist Party to um, extend its influence, one could say interference. And uh, the keyword here is elite capture. Now, not uh, everyone is kind of like a willing uh, agent, let's say, of, of the Chinese Communist Party. It's not a conspiracy uh, theory. Um, however, there are, of course, um, many politicians, but also professionals who, who have commercial interests in China. Uh, they see opportunities by developing relationships with China, and uh, they want to um, keep those channels of communication and collaboration open. And um, if that's your default position, then you will argue in favor of uh, dialogue and cooperation. You can argue that way. This seems reasonable. Um, the problem, of course, is that very often what is then being um, sold as kind of dialogue is not genuine dialogue. It doesn't merit uh, to be called that way. And um, what is being uh, lauded as cooperation is actually cooperation under coercion. And so therefore I find it um, uh, very problematic uh, uh, when, when listening to uh, some German, but also European elites, um, when they talk about China in a in a very depoliticized way, um, because it seems to me that um, they're not upholding enlightened European values. Um, they're pursuing their very individual interests. Um, and so I think uh, it is the task of, for example, independent academics like myself, uh, academics with a conscience to, to speak plainly and clearly and to express a sentiment that is actually much more widely felt uh, on the mass level um, and to give voice to this kind of sentiment that um, yeah, not like for many Europeans, um, we, we don't think only about the bottom line. We also think about democracy and human rights, the rule of law, sustainability, and all these uh, other concerns that we have. And we, we would not pr prioritize the commercial relationship over any other concern that we have. And so I think in, in the kind of dis discussion with, with politicians, with diplomats, with business leaders, with other academics, I, I certainly will always uh, argue that uh, we should pursue a value-based German foreign policy. We should pursue a value-based European foreign security policy. Now, uh, of course, uh, it, we will not always be able to um, get everything that we want, but at least we should demand 100. And if we get 30, we're 30 ahead. 
So that kind of pragmatism, I think, um, can be married with a principled stance, uh, which uh, yeah, prioritizes, you know, these kind of normative uh, concerns, um, knowing that in, in the actual kind of policy process, in the political process, yes, sometimes we will, of course, have to make uh, compromises. But this is kind of like the attitude that I have, and that's how I try to yeah, yeah, contribute and help inform um, a more value-oriented uh, German and European China policy.